you know, I found out that this club still existed, and I said, I should belong to that club. Why don't I belong to that club? So I tracked them down, found their website, insisted that they let me be a member, and I've stayed a member ever since. And there were a few years that work made it difficult to participate because they still meet on a, at midday on Fridays. Um, but most of those years I did manage to continue to participate. Um, for a few years I was the program chair, took a few years off when I was really busy with work, and then in the last couple years I've been more involved again. You know, I'm a history geek. Um, I'm definitely a Northwest women's history geek, and one of our members, Karen Blair, was one of my professors at, at the University of Washington long ago, and um, her focus of her research is women's clubs, and I was a student of hers. I got interested in women's clubs, and their importance in moving a lot of progressive causes along back in, you know, the early part of the 20th, late, late 19th, early 20th century, and um, I've continued my interest in women's clubs, and actually, you know, I'm totally an amateur historian, but I do tend to go down those rabbit holes of looking into um, the history of women in our region and their contributions. And, um, so anyway, that's what brought me to this club, and that's probably why I stick around. And I would just feel really bad if the club disappeared. So um, I'm now the membership chair, and I'm trying to beat the bushes and find us some new members so we can stay viable. We try to have programs that are of interest to our members. So we tend to be interested in arts and culture and history, uh, but. I'm trying to make us relevant to a younger audience by having important conversations as well. So we've recently had um, a program about missing and murdered ind indigenous women, and we had a panel discussion featuring women, a, a state legislator and a, a tribal advocate and a, a liaison officer for the Washington State Patrol. And so we actually got a huge turnout for that, and we're reaching even beyond our geographic boundaries and age boundaries. So I feel like we're kind of on to something. We need to we need to continue to have important conversations, and even though we're not political, we can advocate for things that we think are important. Um, we took an eco tour on the Duwamish River that was offered by the Duwamish tribe. Um, and that really opened our eyes to ways that we can be allies and advocates for communities like the Duwamish. So we think that by convening those kind of conversations, we can continue to be a place where, where primarily women, interesting women, intelligent women, get together to learn, to talk, to challenge ourselves to continue to be viable and contributing citizens. And then we have some some wonderful men that join us from time to time as well. So and people who prefer not to not to specify a gender. What is the woman's century? Well the nineteenth century was known as the woman's century. Um, interestingly, because women hadn't had a chance to get to vote in this country for the most part yet, um, it was a very optimistic, aspirational term. Um, and there are other women's, women's century clubs around the country, probably most of which no longer exist. But um, that, we hold on to it. We try to get people to spell it correctly. Um, and you know what, I think anytime anybody asks a question about something, it's an opportunity to engage them, so I, I would not support changing the name of the club. I did come across a Singer sewing machine ad from, um, you know, obviously some, somewhere in the 19th century, the late 19th century, and they, they use that term, the woman's century, and it's an ad to get them to buy a sewing machine. So that's, I think, pretty interesting, that it was obviously current enough and recognized enough a term that it was used in advertising by big companies. So I, I, that would make a really good research project. We should.